So apologies, I don't know why the music didn't play, but take it away. Okay, thank you. I'll see if I can share my screen here and we'll get started. All right, so um, to introduce our talk, um, first thank you for having us and giving us the opportunity to present what uh, for us is a very interesting topic. We hope it'll be of interest to you. Um, for early career psychologists, we hope to share with you some practical tools that we found useful uh, and have drawn on the work of many other psychologists. And uh, for those of you that may be more statistically inclined than I, we'd also welcome your feedback uh, as we go through these practical tools for uh, attempting to improve diagnostic accuracy. If there are things about our approach that you um, find that there may be some flaw in our assumptions or our reasoning, uh, we welcome any input uh, since some of this is a, a work in progress. So what we'll be going through are um, a series of examples to try to demonstrate um, how we can use Bayesian analyses to try to um, obtain the most information possible out of uh, test scores that we derive from an individual examinee. So unlike um, a statistical analysis that might compare two groups of people, and we may use traditional or frequentist statistics, um, our interest in Bayesian statistics uh, is very practical. And what we're attempting to do is to determine what is the probability of a condition of interest, the diagnosis, um, based up on a single test score. And um, more importantly, if we're able to move beyond that, um, based on an aggregate or a joint conditional probability of multiple test scores. Um, so uh, that's kind of an overview. And the examples that we'll be using are um, looking at uh, test scores from a, a test of um, from malingering, the TOM. We'll also look at some tests trying to um, move from a pretest probability to post-test probability for ADHD, autism, some aspects of Parkinson's disease, uh, and then uh, we'll uh, share with you where we're at in our attempt to develop a machine learning algorithm to assist the diagnostician um, in the differential diagnosis of uh, different neurodevelopmental conditions. So um, in this process, here are some of the, the resources that we've identified uh, that we want to uh, acknowledge. Um, first is a statistical program that's made available and made available by the JASP team and Dr. Eric Jan Wagonmakers. Um, secondly, uh, software that's made available by Professor John Crawford. Um, both of those are freely available and have been generously um, posted so that uh, if you're interested, you can also uh, check those out. And uh, toward the end, I'll be uh, hopefully having time to demonstrate uh, a machine learning software program called the Easy Lab developed by a French company. So um, the point of departure for this is why all the math? Why do we need all of this? And uh, the crux of it is that um, there's been decades of research in psychology as well as behavioral economics about the pitfalls of human judgment. And there's too many references for me to provide for this. So I'm just going to hit upon a few going back as far as Francis Bacon and his work, a new organ or essentially a, an introduction to the scientific method. And um, I'll just point out a few quotes uh, from Francis Bacon. The human understanding, when it has once adopted an opinion, draws, draws all things else to support and agree with it. So here we have uh, an early anticipation of what we would now call confirmatory bias. Uh, and he goes on to say, it's the peculiar and perpetual error of human intellect to be more moved and excited by affirmatives than by negatives. So I think this point kind of captures both um, uh, a um, representativeness heuristic or um, also a saliency bias. So these are uh, heuristic biases or shortcuts in mental reasoning, uh, which although they can be useful, may also lead us to making errors in logic. So how this all applies to diagnostic reasoning, I've tried to sort of encapsulate in a little diagram in the bottom left where we have a simple two by two contingency matrix and COI refers to the condition of interest, the diagnosis, whether it's actually present or, or the condition, whether it's present or absent. And on the left column, a positive test result or a negative test result. And the simple point is that many clinicians uh, are um, 
tend to be drawn toward the positive test result as being indicative of the condition being present. And that may be the case many times, but we need to attend more to the other uh, cells in that matrix. Um, instead of just focusing on the positive uh, test result, uh, reflexively leading us to conclude that the, the condition is present without understanding or knowing the sensitivity or specificity of the test or the base rate of the condition of interest. So um, in terms of uh, other uh, uh, work that informs what we're attempting to do, uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the work of Daniel Kahneman and Tversky uh, in, in economics and in psychology. And essentially their focus is on decision-making under uncertainty, which is quite relevant to di the diagnostic process. Um, here are some examples of heuristic biases, and I'll try to tie these in with examples that pertain to diagnosis, since as a practicing and primarily a clinician, my interest is if I have a, a child or an adult, I'm doing a diagnostic evaluation, what are these biases that I need to be aware of uh, and sensitive to? So the first one we've already mentioned from Francis Bacon, confirmation bias, and that refers to the tendency to kind of pay attention to information which confirms our, say, initial impression of a diagnosis uh, and perhaps overlook other information that may disagree. Representativeness heuristic uh, refers to um, making judgments about the probability of an event based on um, whether it's uh, similar to, say, a prototype. So an example of this may be if I work with children and I'm doing a diagnostic evaluation for ADHD and I have in my mind sort of a representative prototype of a child with ADHD and it's this child who's restless and fidgety and all around the exam room and taking the alcohol foam and making a you know, Santa Claus face out of it. Um, that's my image of say the typical ADHD child. And then I have another child the next day who isn't all over around the room, but maybe that boy or girl is very inattentive. Um, so the danger would be in the diagnostic reasoning if I simply relied on this idea of the prototypical hyperactive ADHD child. Um, the availability heuristic refers to recent information perhaps um, having more of a um, influence on a diagnostic decision than it should. That could be based on something I've been reading about just prior to seeing uh, a case, for example. A saliency bias is uh, that people are drawn to what's the most emotionally striking information. Uh, so an example of that would be in the world of news, what is newsworthy? Well, if it bleeds, it leads. And similarly with diagnostic testing, as I mentioned before, we tend to be perhaps drawn more toward positive findings being associated with the likelihood of a condition and overlook uh, other information. And then finally, illusory correlation as it pertains to diagnostic reasoning uh, may be um, a tendency to overestimate the correlation between an, an individual test score and the presence of a condition. So hopefully with our published test, there is some correlation, but uh, if you don't really look into the psychometric properties of the test, uh, there may be a tendency toward um, overestimating that, that correlation. So that's why I love test manuals and encourage you all to, um, when you adopt a new test, be sure to um, look at the manuals as well as the appendices because there's a lot of information available there and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so uh, Sir William Osler, medicine is the science of uncertainty and the art of probability. So essentially our talk has quite a bit to do with uh, the use of probability for diagnostic reasoning. Claude Shannon um, developed information theory and uh, really defined uh, information entropy as a measure of information content of a message. But interestingly, it's defined as the extent to which it reduces uncertainty. Does the message reduce our uncertainty? And so similarly in diagnostic reasoning, we think that the diagnostic evaluation should, shouldn't be a process of increasing our confidence, say in our initial impression, Diagnostic evaluation should essentially be a process of decreasing uncertainty, where we start with a lot of uncertainty, obtain information, and progressively become less uncertain as we go until we narrow it down to what the most likely diagnosis is. So now I'm going to uh, pass it over to uh, Karen and ask her to talk with us a little bit about Bayes' theorem. Okay, thank you, Tim. Um, 
let me just try and share my screen here. Give me one moment. Can you guys see that okay? It's, uh, it's on the presenter view. Okay, give me one sec. So I don't want to waste too much time. I'll just share what I have here, um, if that's all right. And uh, just like Tim said, you know, we, we want to get as much information as possible from each test score. And just returning to that, that four by, that two by two uh, matrix that, that he introduced earlier, um, you know, as psychologists, we're familiar with this. You know, we work with this all the time. You know, we have um, tests sensitivity, we have test specificity, but we also have positive predictive values and negative predictive values that we can get about a condition. And usually what many psychologists do is they spend a lot of time focusing on the sensitivity and specificity uh, of a test, which is very good. Those, those aspects are really important. Um, but what I wanted to kind of emphasize today is that you know, we really want to spend a little bit more time from a Bayesian perspective uh, thinking about the, the positive predictive value, which, you know, when we're looking at, uh, at the rows across, we're looking at the correct categorization of people having or not having the condition of interest, whereas the columns are really more concerned about the test itself. So I think it's important to kind of keep that in mind. Um, and the PPV is, um, very much similar to what we're trying to assess when we are doing uh, Bayesian analysis. So um, this is Bayes' theorem, and some of you may or may not be familiar with this. It might be a little bit scary looking, um, but um, I was really happy to, to hear that the probability was actually mentioned in, in the previous lecture, the previous talk by Dr. Uh, Tottenham, um, which was a really great talk on emotion regulation. She alluded to the balloon uh, analog risk test, which is a test of decision making, but it's also a test of implicit probabilistic thinking. Um, and so basically, this is a quantification, if you will, of what's happening in our minds and what's happening in the environment when we're trying to understand um, if there's a condition, um, if there's a evidence of a condition uh, in our clinic. So basically, this theorem is telling us, you know, we're trying to, that we're trying to find the probability of having the condition, which I call H, given the data. And this is what we're trying to do as scientists. What are we basing it on? Well, we're basing it on three pieces of information. We're basing it on the probability of the condition, which is called the prior. And this represents our initial belief um, about um, how common we might think this condition is. We also have the, the likelihood, which is the probability of the um, data given the condition. That should say D and that should say H. That's a typo there. Um, and then this is the marginal probability. This is the probability of getting the data. So if we were to break this down, we would say that this is a probability, again, of, of having the condition, of having the data, uh, of getting the data if you have the condition. Um, and these are all independent of each other. And this special notation here means not. So um, this is the probability of having the condition uh, times the probability of the data uh, given the condition, which is basically the numerator. And you're just adding to that the probability of getting the data if they didn't have the condition times the probability of not having the condition at all. Um, so if we wanted to break this down and use terms that we're familiar with in psychology, what we're doing is we're basically looking at the prevalence or the base rate um, and, um, and the data itself. 
So the prior probability in this case would really be the prevalence or, or like I said, the base rate of the condition. That could be autism, it could be Alzheimer's, um, what have you. Um, the likelihood is the, the data that you're presenting to the table. Um, the uh, denominator right here is going to be derived from the specificity um, and the prevalence uh, data that we have about the condition. And I think, Tim, this is where you take over. So I'm going to sh stop sharing my screen. Okay, thank you. Let me bring my screen back up. Okay, so I'll be continuing now with some uh, examples of applying um, Bayes' theorem to some common tests and what type of information we can derive from that. So the first example is the test of memory malingering. Uh, many of you will be familiar with this and I'm, I'll be talking about a, an example of a score on trial two. Um, and this approach is not new to us certainly, but um, I just want to use this as a, a straightforward example to orient you to the type of inf information uh, we can obtain by using uh, JASP to help us look at this example. So we have a trial to and an examinee, um, uh, an individual examinee's test score. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the test, there's 50 items um, and there's a, a probability of each item being either correct or incorrect of, of 50%. So um, here's some information about the JASP program. And our example is trial two raw score of 17. Um, and the question is, is this score significantly lower than the random range? Now, this is a very stringent way of interpreting this test. Uh, we know that there are norms for different uh, groups of people, uh, normal healthy individuals versus other groups. But this is really just an example of applying the a Bayesian binomial test to uh, answer the question, is this score of 17 um, significantly less than the, the random range? So uh, if we are using the JASP program, what we have in the left side of the screen is a test value of 0.5, rep which represents the um, probability of correct answer for each of the independent test items. And we're going to use uh, a non-informative prior, which in this case essentially means we're not really paying attention to how easy or hard the test is or assuming no other knowledge about the test, only that it's a 50-50 chance of each test correct. And when we uh, put the data in for a, a score of 17 out of 50 correct, uh, what we uh, derive using the Bayesian binomial, binomial test is a score called the Bayes factor. And on this slide, uh, we have the results of this and we can see the Bayes factor in the upper left, which I've put in the, the red box, is 4.43. And uh, this uh, graph, which is also um, derived from the JASP team, helps us to interpret what's the meaning of a Bayes factor in this range. And a score of 4.43 provides moderate evidence in favor of the alternative hypothesis. So in this example, the null hypothesis is the score of 17 is essentially in the random range, and our alternative hypothesis is that it's substantially lower than the, than the random range. So in this case, we have moderate degree of evidence that this score, as you would probably intuitively understand, is uh, moderately below the random range. Um, these pie charts here are a quick and useful way um, that this information is represented in the JAS program where the alternative hypothesis is represented in the white space and the red refers to the degree of support for the alternative hypothesis, which in this case is lower than the random range. Um, on the bottom, we have a sequential analysis, which nicely shows us for each um, item on the test, uh, does that response trend more toward the null hypothesis or the alternative hypothesis? So in this example, I put in uh, scores for an individual examinee that are trending toward um, correct responses, and then at some point during the test, trend the other way toward the alternative toward um, answering the items incorrectly. Um, however, that conclusion of having a very stringent test of whether the test score is below random, that happens very rarely. Um, another thing we can do is use some empirical data to inform our analysis of the meaning of a test score. So what we've done here is we've looked in the Tom manual and in the appendix we find uh, 
a small sample, but helpful of a dementia, uh, a sample of individuals with dementia in, on the trial two of the TOM. And I've represented that here with this um, violin uh, plot. So in the dementia group, the raw score, the mean raw score in trial two is actually 46. Um, and very few people score, you know, 11% have scores below 40 and 8% below 38, even in, in a dementia group. So we can then use this information and change our question now from is a score, a certain score below random, and instead ask, is it below the range we would obtain from a, a group with dementia? What's the strength of evidence that a person, for example, with a score of 38 out of 50 correct, or 0.76, is lower than the dementia group of 46 out of 50 or 0.92? So what we've done is update our JASP uh, data entry to a test value of 0.92 representing the proportion correct for the dementia group. And we asked the same question, is this particular score below the range of, um, of the dementia group? And what we find is a very strong evidence for the alternative hypothesis that it's, this score is below the range obtained by this uh, small sample of uh, individuals with dementia. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, turn it over to uh, Kayla to talk with us about the same approach different software application, but the same approach to ADHD classification. All right. Um, I'll actually be using your screen okay. and slides. <laughs> so I will put them back up then. Okay, thank you. And you can just tell me when to advance. Okay, I'll do that. Um, so uh, I'm going to be talking about how to use this kind of approach to look at ADHD classification accuracy. So this is using the Connors 3 parent rating scales and the Connors CBT3 scores, which are known as our gold standard measures of ADHD diagnosis. And um, we're gonna include and incorporate ADHD prevalence data for Connecticut, along with Bayesian methods to go beyond what's in the test manual to understand the post-test probability in our own clinics. So we're wondering how much certainty do these kind of scores add to our diagnostic process in our own clinics, not just in the manual. So uh, per the manual, um, this is a lot of information about um, how the scores were combined, the CPT3 scores and the Connors parent rating skills. Um, but I think the most important thing to point out here is the sample that was used. So uh, in the manual, the sample prevalence of ADHD was 57 out of 112. So about 50% of the participants in the Connors sample had ADHD. Um, so again, the software that we're using in this example comes from Professor John Crawford. And the ADHD prevalence inputs are epidemiological. Um, so we're looking to find the post-test point probability of a girl in Connecticut having, an ADHD, having ADHD, given what we're just going to call a positive test finding on the Connors measures. So we're going to use the prevalence data from Connecticut to see how our results differ for a clinic that might be different from the Connors norm clinic. So they saw 50% of their participants had ADHD. For us, we're gonna use this Connecticut data. So here um, in the Connecticut sample, 31 participants, female participants had ADHD. Um, and you know there were a few hundred that didn't. Um, so this base rate is a lot lower than what the Connors manual used so we're going to input all this data now. So we're, we're using a positive test result from the Connors test, and we're using this objective data from the prevalence study. So these first four entries uh, in the column are from the Connors technical manual. And then those last two numbers in the column are from the epidemiological information in Connecticut for the base rate of ADHD in girls. So we enter this information, and we see it's not circled, but our base rate's about 7% different from 50%. And the post-test probability uh, of the presence of ADHD given a positive Connors test result is 0.373. So let's look at that kind of more on a graph. So the green shows the pre-test probability distribution based on the base rate. So that's just the likelihood of a girl in Connecticut having ADHD walking into the clinic. Then the red curve shows the updated post-test probability distribution based on the positive Connors test score. So you see the shift to the right, so an increase in probability. We get up to about 
but that's not as high as you might imagine it would be. And as we've kind of been talking about, clinicians kind of, we can sometimes reflexively assume that a positive test result indicates the presence of a condition. This person has high scores on the Connors Parent Rating Scale, they bombed the CPT, and they probably have ADHD. Um, but this Bayesian approach is showing us that based on the base rate of ADHD in girls in Connecticut, because it's so low, the positive test result doesn't shift the probability as much as we might expect. So in this case, the manual makes the test look like a positive score, which shifts the probability much further. But that's because the base rate in their sample was so much higher than what we see locally in our own clinic. Okay, thank you. And I, I would add to that, that um, so we have two, ex two examples there. Uh, the manual refers to a clinic with a very high um, base rate of ADHD, and then the community sample is on the other extreme. And in the middle is the value of obtaining your own local uh, base rate data or uh, coming up with an informed estimate, which could also be used for this. So I'll be now going very quickly through a few other examples. Uh, this, these refer to the uh, tests that try to help us understand the probabi probability of the presence of autism. Um, it's the same method, so I'll go through quickly. It's just substituting um, the uh, information and seeing how, to what extent do the data shift the post-test probability uh, based on, on the test as well as the prevalence of the condition. So here's a confusion matrix for the Childhood Autism Rating Scale, uh, also derived from the manual. Uh, and in this sample, um, the prevalence of autism is 0.58, and their classification accuracy index, or one of them is 0.93 based on this. But we're going to look, integrate some epidemiological data. Uh, this is national uh, uh, data set um, for our information about prevalence. Uh, do the same thing, put the information into, to try to derive the uh, interval estimates for post-test probabilities using uh, Crawford's application, and we see in this case for this particular test using the community-based uh, prevalence data, the post-test probability is uh, 0.162. So we've shifted from a, uh, a very low base rate of the condition of interest to somewhat more given a positive test result, and this is for autism among boys. Um, we can also look at the, the likelihood of um, autism with another questionnaire, the Autism Syndrome Screening Questionnaire, refer to their manual for the same type of information, um, put that data in, and we see again, in this case, the post-test probability is 0.114, which sort of moves our needle over um, somewhat, um, but perhaps not as much as many people might expect given their uh, clinical practice. And then finally, we can use the social responsiveness scale for the same thing. This is from uh, information in the, in the uh, published articles that also refer to a, a larger um, uh, interactive Autism Network study, and uh, we, in this case, use the same type of epidemiological data, and we see the post-test probability um, for the presence of autism given a positive test result is 0 0.30. So this moves our uh, post-test probability over uh, a little bit more. Um, so now I'll, I'll turn it back over to uh, Karen, and she can pick up here. Thanks, and you can share, continue sharing your screen. Okay. I don't want to have that kerfuffle again. All right. Thank you, and I'll go through these slides quickly as well. Um, so, you know, we can ask the same question for any type of condition. Um, so if we wanted to take data um, and, and predict, you know, the probability of whether or not a patient with Parkinson's disease has um, dementia, you know, we could use that information here as well. Um, and plug that into, into this equation. The other thing that I wanted to add though was, you know, we don't have to just look at one test. You can complete this same method for any test, like if you gave, you know, a screening test or waste digits or any, any measure theoretically. And as long as you multiply the posterior probabilities together, you'll get more information to reduce your level of uncertainty. Um, and so the next slide kind of shows, I just kind of, use guesstimate, guesstimated some numbers. Um, and this is based on, on MOCA data. Um, you know, if we had somebody with Parkinson's disease come into a clinic and we gave them a MOCA and they scored below uh, 24, they'd have a 68% probability um, 
of having, um, you know, cognitive impairment um, or, or Parkinson's disease dementia. Um, we could apply this um, using a, a tree as well, which I think is a little bit easier to understand from a decision-making perspective. So I think what this uh, slide is basically trying to show is that whenever you see a patient, you really, from a Bayesian perspective, you first want to consider the prevalence or the base rate. That's the number one thing. Of course, the second thing that you want to know is, you know, does the person, uh, is the person diagnosed with any type of condition? And then you kind of want to take the information from the, the test statistics to calculate the probability of whether or not they have a condition. So, um, for example, we have, um, you know, 0 0.96, 0 0.95, 0 0.05, and a question mark. Notice that all we really care about is the, the sensitivity and specificity for people who, uh, in, in those who have the condition. And we only care about those who don't have the condition if they have a false positive. Uh, we don't really care about the true negatives. Um, so I think this is a kind of a good visual. Um, in the next slide, I think it's important to consider that this number that we're calculating, it can change. And that's the beauty of Bayesian theory. One, it can change with the prevalence of the disease. We're getting more and more data um, for more studies that are going on through public, public health, through, through psychology. Um, we can improve our, um, our uh, prediction model by updating the prior, because um, that'll increase the probability of detection. Um, the other thing we can do is if we come out with new tests, tests that are more sensitive or specific, that increases our probability, obviously, of detecting a disease. Um, in this, in general, though, you know, specificity is more important than sensitivity. You want to be able to correctly categorize, um, you know, those who who don't have it. Um, the last thing I wanted to mention is that um, um, that this this graph is kind of showing us is showing how things can change. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention was if you, can, if you perform a posterior probability calculation, you can use that posterior probability as your prior the next time around. And that's called Bayesian chaining. Um, so the point is that get as much info as possible, keep updating the prior, keep getting more data, and get more accurate results. Um, so the next slide gives you a website where you can kind of play around with that. I'm not going to go over that now, but you can go on that website, um, move the, the figures around, and you'll get a sense of um, um, how things fall probabilistically on a graph. Um, I could also go over really quickly another real-world example of Bayesian analysis. So there was a, a great study done um, by uh, Dawson and his colleagues, um, and they looked at um, office-based screening for Parkinson's disease, disease dementia. Um, and they developed a kind of scale called the Montreal Parkinson Risk of Dementia Scale. Um, and it applied machine learning um, to kind of um, make those posterior predictions. So basically, you have eight criteria here you, that you can see in table one. Um, and it takes in, you know, sex, falls, MCI status, and so forth. And if you meet a cutoff of four or more, then you'll use the data on the right in this testing set to kind of calculate um, the posterior probability. Um, again, when you're doing machine learning, in this type of modeling, you're not just taking all the data and just sticking it into the machine. You're splitting the data up and you're validating it. So you set across, you set, up, uh, you set apart, per, usually by convention, 75% or so of the training data, um, and you do your modeling on that, and then you apply those parameters onto the testing set to see if it works. Um, so in the next slide, what we find is that, you know, we can combine information from that posterior uh, probability with other um, um, data. So for example, you know, if we want to take a look at this, this figure here that looks at hazard ratios, we find that at any time, a patient with a score of four or five on the Mopards, you know, they were about 10 times more likely to develop dementia versus those with a lower score. So if we pull out that value that we calculated earlier uh, in the talk and we multiply that by 10, 
that tells us that this particular patient is seven times um, more likely to develop dementia or to convert from MCI to dementia in a, par um, uh, in a Parkinson's sample. Does, um, does that kind of make sense? I want to make sure that that makes sense to everybody because I kind of flew through it. Okay. And this is just a procedure to, to kind of uh, calculate the posterior. You can. Okay, um, thank you. And so we're gonna um, kind of move on now toward um, what we had mentioned before uh, about not looking at just a single test score, but can we uh, aggregate test scores in terms of multiple probabilities to help us uh, determine the presence or absence of a condition of interest. So um, our goal in this project, which is uh, a, a working project and in, in still in progress, is to develop a diagnostic decision support tool to help us improve accuracy uh, diagnosis of autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions and in the process to identify which elements of the history, symptoms, or test results most efficiently establish the diagnosis with uh, a high level of certainty. So uh, Kayla, do you want to share yeah. uh, with us about the Child Mind Institute study? Sure, so the data we're using for this project comes from the Healthy Brain Network study, which is run by the Child Mind Institute. And they're based out of Manhattan. Uh, I was a research assistant on this project for a couple of years before graduate school, so it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, the project's goal is to create a large, rich database of information to facilitate the discovery of biological markers of children's mental illness and diagnostic accuracy. And the data are released openly to scientists to facilitate this kind of discovery. And the set itself lends itself to big data approaches like machine learning because it has so much information. So it has questionnaires, blood testing data, cognitive measures, and uh, the diagnoses that are assigned to the participants are created through consensus diagnosis through a semi-structured interview, not from the test data. So you're really able to look at the test separate from the diagnoses to determine their accuracy. So um, the richness of this data set, I think, reflects the richness of data that clinicians have when we make decisions. We have history and symptoms and dozens of assessment results, and we have to integrate all these to come to a conclusion. Um, and we know that comorbid psychiatric diagnoses are common in the data set, the Healthy Brain Network data set. Uh, individuals can have up to eight diagnostic classifications. Uh, so that means that the number of potentially unique diagnostic combinations uh, is eight factorial, which is over 40,000. So uh, in some of the previous examples we've been showing, we've been looking at the probability uh, for one specific diagnosis, like ADHD, given one specific test result, like the Connors. But now we're trying to integrate the impact of multiple exam findings on many possible diagnostic categories. All right, thank you. So um, just briefly, a, a few um, uh, contributors to kind of recognize in terms of the history of psychology. Um, I would put Paul Meal in this group um, for his overriding contributions to the importance of uh, actuarial approaches to diagnosis. Um, and in terms of um, machine learning, um, just for those of you that may not be familiar, uh, the work of Judea Pearl, um, the book on the left is more technical. The book on the right is more accessible, certainly for, for me as I try to uh, understand some of this. Um, there's also an interesting interview link here uh, from 2019. Um, and I'd like to just kind of highlight two things here, going back to Francis Bacon in, in 1620, and then fast forward to 2020. Um, you know, different periods in time, but something very similar comes through. So Francis Bacon talks about um, this um, example of the men of experiment being like the ant, as he describes uh, or introduces a scientific method. So the men of experiment are like the ant on the bottom, and they only collect and use observations. And then the reasoners, more the philosophical uh, reasoners, are like the spiders, and they have very abstract theories like cobwebs. And the bee, uh, representing sort of the path of science, goes back and forth between um, the uh, observation and, uh, and reasoning. And in this particular example with the Bayesia lab, I was struck by the parallel with the integration of data from the bottom up and knowledge modeling from the top down. And so many other machine learning 
um, products I'm sure can do this, but in, in this example, what we're showing is a sort of data up approach to developing a Bayesian network to integrate this information without any top down or expert knowledge. So the example here is um, a simple uh, question is autism present or absent, yes or no. And in the uh, Healthy Brain Network um, Child Mind Institute data set, there's 89 um, or 90% of the children do not have a diagnosis of autism and 10% did. So as um, was mentioned, a little earlier, uh, the approach to this involves uh, a learning data set and then cross validated with a test data set. And we broke that, this up into 80 and 20%. And what we see here is a visual representation of each variable represented by a circle or a node in the network. And the one in the center is the diagnostic question, is autism present or absent? And all of the variables around the outside uh, are primarily self-report or parent completed questionnaires for the most part. Now there is a problem with our current model because although we've taken effort to remove highly correlated um, variables, such as a total score on one scale, scale and the subscale scores on that identical scale, there still are some correlations among the, the variables which can be problematic um, as opposed to each input variable being independent. But nonetheless, uh, we wanted to share with you um, this example. And I may be able to uh, briefly show you how it works um, with the software itself. So our learning sample uh, had 1,276 cases and the overall precision was 89%. And um, this example, uh, you know, was a little bit better with the large number in the learning sample. And then the, the accuracy dropped down with a smaller case set of 319. And one of the factors, one of the things that influences this is called overfitting in which the initial, um, the, the network learns the patterns of relationships and the, the conditional probabilities among the variables in the training set and be, can become quite efficient with that set. But when you have a uh, cross validation set, the accuracy will often go down uh, if those cases are very different than the ones that it learned on or um, if there simply just aren't enough uh, subjects. Um, so we resampled uh, using a K-fold cross validation in which uh, the same data set is repeatedly 10 times sampled with a different mix of cases. And these are the findings there. So it's a start uh, in terms of um, working toward or trying to develop um, a model that helps us to improve the accuracy of diagnosis. And at some point, uh, we may try to integrate some top-down expert knowledge as well. So what this looks like as a visual representation of the data, um, these are some of the variables. Um, the uh, node in the center is the presence or absence of, of autism. Uh, and each variable is connected to uh, the others um, by an arc. Um, and here we have sort of the strength of the relationship uh, among the input variables and how they relate to the presence or absence of autism. And uh, this is a three-dimensional representation of what it looks like as a network, um, which uh, we can sort of physically manipulate and turn for uh, data exploration. So without going into the software, I wanna leave some time for questions and also not run over into our, our next speaker's time. Uh, but this is uh, how it does with the developing a, a, a preliminary network for the presence or absence of autism. And where we're going with this is the idea of developing a user interface for uh, the practicing clinician, where uh, on this particular monitor, we have uh, a graph which represents the presence or absence of autism, or what's the probability of one versus the other. And in this case, um, before we input any information or test scores, this is the base rate of autism of 10.43%. And then when we set the evidence for the input variables, it will dynamically adjust uh, the probability uh, of your condition of interest if this model is um, accurately optimized. And ultimately, the user interface would look like this. Um, this is just posted but not functional at this point. And essentially, the same type of thing occurs as the user um, puts an individual uh, examinee's test scores into their appropriate um, uh, value here. The uh, probability of autism in the monitor on the right will increase or decrease. Um, so I think uh, we'll stop there and perhaps invite any, any <laughs> questions or comments uh, from, from others. Excellent, thank you. That was a really 
really fantastic talk. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have heard it. Um, and to, I'm just still learning about all this. So this was a great introduction for me. You have a few questions. So in the Tom example, and perhaps I misunderstood, just because there are two choices does not mean they are equally likely to occur. So that should be reflected in the pretest probability. Again, maybe I misunderstood, but I thought it was said the sequential analysis in JASP pertains to number of items, but I believe it only refers to sample size. Yeah, I'm not sure I, I caught the last part, but I agree with uh, the person asking the question. Um, the first part of the example was intended to represent um, no prior knowledge about the level of difficulty of each item. So sort of as an example of uh, simply knowing that we have a test uh, in which each item has a 50% chance of being correct or incorrect if we, if we have no um, prior uh, information. And then um, where to go from there would be to then build into that model information about the level of difficulty uh, for each item. So we could have the, uh, uh, a prior that's um, informed by how a, a healthy, um, a uh, group of people who are giving good effort perform, and we could have another prior for a group of people who are um, attempting to feign cognitive impairment. So the example, the first part of the example was intended to be uh, simply as assuming that each item uh, has equal difficulty and a 50-50 chance of being correct or incorrect. Great. Um, next question. The base rate issue is interesting. Does it make more sense to use a population base rate or the base rate for the individual clinic? If the population base rate of ASD is 2%, but I find that I diagnose 50% of my patients with autism, a biased sample is referred to me, for example, which one would be more appropriate? I can, uh, do either of you want to add? I, I have a thought, but let me give you a chance to respond as well. So I think this is a really interesting question, and um, I think I think it ultimately boils down to a judgment a judgment call. Um, you know, obviously, as psychologists, if we're working in a clinic, we're going to naturally see patients with with disease. So uh, that population based rate may not be accurate. I think if personally, if I if I had my independent clinic, you know, I would try to. Um, I might initially start with the population based rate, or I might try to ensure that the diagnosis that I have is um, substantiated by, by independent evidence, and then try and infer what that might be um, for my own clinic. But I'm not sure how, how you would feel about it, Tim. No, I, I, I agree. I, I think what I would say to that is that the population based uh, prevalence is going to sort of um, yield uh, a lower level of accuracy uh, because we're not taking our neuropsychological tests and walking down the street knocking on random doors to see, you know, what the likelihood of a diagnosis is. We're, we're all working in location. So I think that if you have your local base rate data or have a, a good sense of that enough to have a subjective prior, that that's probably going to yield more accurate information. And so our examples were really to sort of compare two extremes. A, say the technical manuals in which the base rate of the condition of interest is very high and the community where it may be very low. And um, ideally, we hope to encourage you to you know, obtain information about your, your particular practice and, and integrate that information. Okay, and the last question, um, in the Bayesian network example, which is a very cool visual representation of variable relationships, you noted the high correlations among some variables. Is there a reason not to use partial correlations between all variables to account for the overlap? I'm not sure. Um, I'd have to, uh, partial correlations, you mean to use the partial correlations prior to inputting the information? I'm not exactly sure. Um, so I'll just mention sort of my uh, thought about that is, what we did was, um, for example, if there were a scale that had a total score only, we would just use the total score. But if there's a test that has a total score and say four uh, subscales, we would use the four subscales and remove the total score. But each of those, if you look at the factor analysis of the test being developed, they're not, they're not completely independent. So there is some overlap there. Um, I hadn't thought of using a partial correlation and then working from there. Um, 
but I'd, I'd welcome whoever the question ask, is asking the question. If you have some thoughts, I'd, I'd welcome. Uh, it's hard to do this through the, the virtual world, but uh, if we were in, in person, I'd, I'd ask for more. You, would either of you want to add anything to that? No? Okay. All right, well, thank you very, very much.